Good morning, Kurt. Um, could you briefly introduce yourself and a little bit about your work? Good morning, Ben. Actually, it's probably afternoon there. Afternoon, it? yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you for setting this up. Um, my name is Kurt Lloyd. I work for NASA. I develop software for NASA at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, which is one of NASA's field centers, one of many. Um, some background on myself. I grew up in uh, central Illinois, a very rural area. I grew up around, I grew up in a farmhouse. Um, there's lots of cows and pigs and cornfields around. Um, so it was a very rural um, setting where I grew up. And, uh, but even in that setting, I loved technology. I loved computers. I loved software. Um, uh, I was given, my parents gave me an Apple IIe when I was 12 years old. Um, and this is this is just to just to set the setting. I'm older than people than a lot of people think. This is 1982 or 83, um, uh, and uh, I, I got one. You know, one of the I got an Apple IIe when they were kind of first uh, becoming popular. And um, uh, this is way before the internet, way before YouTube. But I learned to write software on that Apple IIe computer because uh, there's a program called Turtle Tracks where you could drive this little turtle around by programming it. Um, there's similar programs still around today. Um, most kids today find that kind of lame. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a, uh, I found it just amazing back then, back in uh, the early 80s. But uh, in addition to computers and software, I just love tinkering. I love taking things apart and putting them back together. Anytime something would break around the house, my mom would say, hey, Kurt, you know, would you take a look at this toaster or whatever it was, you know, and I would, I would try and fix it. And sometimes I would fix it, but not always. Um, and so I guess I was just kind of just uh, um, geared. I was just bent towards engineering. And so, um, oh, I also had a hobby of building model rockets and shooting them off uh, from uh, our backyard or the, the cornfield uh, in the wintertime when there was no corn, I would uh, shoot the model rockets off back there. Um, so I was, you know, that's how I was wired. And so when I went to college, I chose engineering and I actually got my degree in electrical engineering um, in Missouri. And uh, I know most of the audience uh, is are professionals, but a lot of times I speak to um, young young children, you know, grade school, uh, high school children, and I always tell them that um, where you go to college isn't the most important thing. It's how you do in college and what you learn in college. That's the most important thing. So I always tell kids that because they, they seem to stress so much on where to go to college. And, you know, now that I'm in the workforce and I'm actually hiring, uh, you know, fresh outs, people that just graduated, you know, where they went to college is not nearly as important as, you know, a lot of other things on that resume, like experience. Um, so uh, I did internship. I did have an internship with NASA while I was in college here at the Kennedy Space Center. So that really opened my eyes to NASA and what NASA was all about. And I uh, was lucky enough to get a job here after I graduated. So most of my um, career here at NASA um, has been uh, software development, software testing. Um, I've been here uh, uh, 26 and a half years now. Um, and so that's kind of my growing up and career. And uh, personal-wise, you know, outside of work, I have some hobbies like uh, I sing and act on stage in community theater uh, quite a bit. Um, I like to, when I'm at home, I like to make things out of wood. I have a, a shop where, you know, I, I do woodworking. Um, and I spend a lot of time on home maintenance and repair. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, when something breaks around my house, I, uh, I always try and fix it myself before mm -hmm. I, uh, break down and call a, a professional repairman to come. <laughs> so that's, uh, mm -hmm. that's my, that's my spiel about me. Um, yeah. No, so, I, I, well, give, and I give this spiel before. This is not my, I talk to, um, children in schools a lot. So this is kind of a, a script in my head. Um, now, do you want me to talk about work? Well, I was going to say, I, and I love the story, and I love where it's gone from, you know, being on the farm to, to the fact that you now, you know, been working for NASA. And I'm, I have to say, I'm sitting there like, what do you do? Like, what, what, what's the, what, what is it that you do? Because, again, it's about exploration of Mars, and I've got so many questions. So give us, give us a, uh, an insight yeah. into what you're up to. Okay, so my job here um, at NASA is um, basically I work in a research and development organization um, that is focused on how we could live off the land in Mars. 
that's kind of the summary. And the, the group that I work in, um, we call ourselves the Swamp Works Lab or Swamp Works. And um, we, we use a lean development process in the lab and a real hands-on approach. And it's sort of um, the philosophy for Swamp Works is very closely aligned with Kelly Johnson's Skunk Works, if you've heard of them. Um, or Werner von Braun's uh, development shops way back in the 60s. He had a very agile kind of shop before agile was, you know, really uh, a thing. And uh, so we start small with our concepts and, and we build them up fast. And, you know, if we, if we fail, um, that's actually a good thing because we learn from the failures and then we actually be able to, um, um, to adjust and you know and then not fail the next time um failing at nasa you know um failure is not an option you always hear that about nasa but that's that's true at the very pr production the very far production end of nasa when you've got astronauts you're going to the moon you know you're actually sending you know multi billion dollar payloads to you know mars or whatever like that you don't want that to crash into mars but down in the labs where we're doing researchy and development stuff, we need to be comfortable with failure. And so um, it's, a really, it's a really cool place to work. Um, uh, there's a lot of really neat technologies. And uh, um, I don't want to give too much away, but I'll talk about those technologies um, in my keynote. But it's a, it's a very agile shop. And um, I talked about living off the land. Um, and so that's what this lab, the Swamp Works lab, focuses on, is living off the land. And just to explain that, um, when NASA went to the moon back in the 60s, um, those moon trips were really, you could just kind of consider them short camping trips. Because when we went to the moon, um, we took everything we needed for the trip there, which was like, took like three days to get to the moon. And for the stay on the moon, all of the surface operations on the moon, we took everything we needed, all the food, all the water, all that breathing air, everything we needed, um, and for the trip back. So um, they were basically short camping trips. But when, when NASA starts planning for missions to Mars, human missions to Mars, and we have to figure out food and water and, and you know, everything that the astronauts are going to need to do that, to perform that mission, it takes six months to get to Mars. I mean, plus six months to come back. So that's a year right there. And then, you know, if you're going to spend a year in transit, you're not going to just spend a few days or a few weeks on the surface and then come back. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to actually be in it for the long term. So right now, NASA's plans for human missions to Mars is to um, be on the surface for 18 months. That is a really, really long time. And we don't have the technology to send that much stuff, consumables, water, breathing air, um, rocket fuel to the Mars. And so we're looking at technologies. We're, we're researching and developing technologies um, to use resources that are there. Um, we, uh, it, it would just be cost prohibitive to, to send all that water and all that breathing air. Um, it, you, it's, if, if you do the math, it's, it's a lot, a lot of, of rocket um, ships that have to make that trip just to send all the consumables that you need for that long of a trip. But there are resources that are there. A lot of people don't realize there's a lot of water on Mars. It's not flowing in rivers and lakes like we have it here on Earth, but there is a lot of water on Mars. It's frozen under the surface. And so we're looking, there's also carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which means there's oxygen. Um, we can get we can get oxygen from the water or we can get oxygen from the carbon dioxide either way. Oxygen is great. We can breathe it. There are metals that are in the, the soil on Mars that we could actually extract and make things out of. And just um, if you think about building things on Earth, you know, we use a lot of concrete. Um, but, you know, before we uh, were more modern civilization and we had modern tools, you know, we were building things. You were building clay huts. We were building out of from the ground that was around us. And we can do that on Mars. We can take the the, the rocks and the, um, the dust on Mars, and we can, we can construct things. We can construct buildings um, and uh, structures, and uh, so that's the sort of technology that we work on in Swamp Works. So with, because I, I'm just fascinated, it blows my mind, 
and I, and I really want to know, like, because you're in it and you you understand this, is is it is it realistic that we can build stuff on Mars? Like this whole idea of you know people go in for for six months and that we actually will be able to build you know a, a new civilization on Mars. Is that is that something to you like? Yeah, of course. Or do you still have kind of questions over over it? It's going to take baby steps. Our very first missions to Mars um, are going to be reliant on all the stuff that we send them and the the technologies that we put there that can create oxygen and create rocket fuel. I didn't even mention that we can create rocket fuel on Mars, but um, mm -hmm. the details of that will be in my uh, keynote. Um, but uh, there's always there's always the very first missions are going to be like, you know, we, if, if something goes wrong, we need to be able to, to hop, hop back in that spaceship and, and take back off and, and head back to, to Earth. They're going to have enough consumables for the trip back, you know, in orbit waiting for them. Um, so it's, you know, you're not, you're not going to be able to start a colony if that's what you want to call it you know your your first couple of missions it's mm. gonna every time every time we send a new mission to mars we're gonna send more stuff and send bigger stuff because we'll have better bigger and better rockets so we'll be able to send bigger stuff and better stuff and so i think it's i think it's going to evolve over mm. many many years into what most people consider a colony mm. um, but our first few missions what nasa is focused on right now what most people at NASA are being paid to focus on right now, um, although some of them are looking farther out, most people at NASA are focusing on just our first couple of missions mm. to Mars, plus the missions between now and Mars, like the ISRU missions. A lot of these ISRU, I didn't even, I, I just said ISRU and I didn't even explain it. Um, living off the land on Mars is called ISRU. Um, mm. It's in situ resource utilization. Um, that means uh, in situ is Latin for on site, so it's using the resources that that are on site. So, the, well, so so within that, what you're saying there, and I guess with your work, you you are th you're thinking of the first two missions with the word sustainability. So you are looking at how you can then start put things in motion of how to create you know sustainable farming and, and all of these things. Yes, we're 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 starting small, and yeah. then over time, you know, we will build build up but uh, you know it's kind of it's kind of difficult um, in the government to plan too far in advance because you only get money one year at a time from Congress <laughs> that's uh -huh. how you know that's how the government works they don't they don't promise you money 10 years down the road mm -hmm. so um, we can we do pay some people to think 10 years down the road 30 years down the road and do some paper studies but you know the entire workforce is not working towards a you know a mission that's 30 years away we we have to focus on the near term just based on on the funding now it's interesting in in this day and age with with um private companies like spacex elon musk with uh blue origin um jeff bezos these these billionaires um they can throw as much money as they want to at their team and say i want you to think 50 years from now and start working on the rocket from the, that we're going to use 50 years from now or you know they're not actually i don't think they're actually looking that far ahead but um it's they you know they they could beat us to mars just because they can throw a lot more money at it um they might take more risks than nasa does nasa tends to be a little more conservative and and try to not take huge leaps but to try and take smaller baby steps um i wish them all the luck. I I would not be sad at all if they beat us to Mars. It's not a race between us, you know, between NASA and SpaceX, um, because we're going to learn from each other. You know, our their successes we'll be able to learn from. Their mistakes we'll both be able to learn from. And so, um, you know, all that technology that is developed to get us to Mars, you know, we're all going to benefit from. Mm. And that's I, I talk about that in the keynote. Yeah, and and I can and, and so again, not to spoil too much, but I think we can <laughs> dig a little bit deeper into it because I think or where I was coming from. So, you know, the kind of the fear angle is that you we're building in Mars because we're destroying the Earth and we need to escape, right? Um, there's that 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 that's one notion. But what I can hear from what you're saying and what I'm curious about is. By, it feels like this is um, you know, an amazing problem to try and figure out. And then from that, you can actually develop 
um, technologies that can be utilized here on Earth? That's a that's a great point, and um, um, I should have stressed that because there there is like a group of people that you know are worried that we're going to destroy the Earth and we need to leave it, and that may or may not be the case. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get into you know that, um, but NASA's NASA's job and what we're paid to do is explore and learn about the universe and learn about Earth. So you know we split we look out and we look in. At, at NASA and uh, you know learning more about Mars involves not just sending robots to Mars forever we could send we could send robots to Mars forever and never send humans but they're limited in, in what they can do they're limited in the decisions they can make um, you know what you know how flexible they are they're limited in what what uh, what we can um, put on board the robots as far as chemistry equipment and all that stuff um, but if we send humans to Mars, you know, they, they, they can make decisions on the fly. They have, you know, very, uh, they can see a lot of detail with their eye, you know, with their, with their 3d eyesight. Um, um, and you know, they can make, uh, 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 they're a lot more flexible, you know, when things go wrong, robots, when things go wrong, they have to wait for the people on the, uh, back on earth to make a decision. Well, you know, if, if the thing that's going wrong is you're sliding down a, um, you know, uh, a hill and you're about to tumble over, you know, by the time the people on earth respond to that, you know, it's, it's way too late. So you've got to have the automation on, on board the robot to handle that. And, um, you know, humans already have that automation. We can mm. decide that we're sliding down a hill and, and counteract that, you know? Yeah. And so I, I've there's spoken... a lot of reasons to send humans, uh, to Mars, even, even aside from whether or not we're, we're destroying the earth and, and, hmm. and it's not going to last forever. Yeah, and I've spoken to a couple of the other keynote speakers who are talking about AI um, and what they came or what I got from the conversations there is where the power is going to be is in the union between humans and the AI. Right, this is, where, is what you're saying there is that you could send robots and whatever um, or you could send humans, but like it's that it's the where the power is going to be is when when they're integrated together, where they're really working together yes. on this on the same mission, and and you know what AI will give us or machine learning will give us is a lot of fast data and be able to work on things quick, but ultimately it needs to uh, come around from the values that are being um, developed by humans. Yes, um, and I mentioned earlier that it's not a race between NASA and SpaceX. It's also not a race between, you know, or a contest between robots and humans. When we do send humans to Mars, we're going to have we're going to send robots too, or they'll already be there. And the humans and the robots will work together. The robots will assist. They'll be doing just like we, just like robots on Earth, assist the humans. They do the dangerous work, um, you know, that's too dangerous to send a human into, or you know, things like that. Um, or they can just be a helping hand and that sort of thing. So just like we use robots uh, and technology here on Earth, we're, it, the same is going to be true um, on Mars when we uh, eventually send humans to Mars. And uh, right now we're, we're planning on um, having the technology ready by the 2030s. So in the 2030s, NASA is planning to... Uh, land our first humans on Mars. I know the 2030s is kind of a, <laughs> kind of a big window, but um, it's hard to plan more detailed than, uh, than that uh, mm. this far in advance. And it, interestingly, I was listening to some interviews or a podcast with someone who's gone through or is going through the, the, the kind of the uh, auditions or whatever you want to call it for being a, uh, an astronaut. <laughs> and the first yeah. missions is that you need to go away believing that you're not going to come back. Like it's not like it's not like this is as you say I know you say there's the return trip but like the chances are that you're going to come back are not not so high or that's why that's what I got from there is that and that was really interesting because they're asking about the motivation you know when you sign up for something when you know that you're probably not going to to come back and this was people with children and and all sorts of things I just found that fascinating that there are people who are really dedicated to exploration and wanting to kind of move evolution forward uh, with that 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 sort of commitment well when you and I go to work every morning you know we get in our car and we drive to work every morning there is a small chance that we could not come we might not come home you know there are dangers out there in the world in the in the regular business world that you know things could happen to us and uh, 
Um, but when you're an astronaut, you have those same dangers of going to work, you know, driving to work and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, when you strap yourself into a, a basically a, a rocket is basically a, a controlled bomb. It's a controlled explosion is basically what a rocket is. And so there's there's a lot of moving parts there. There's a lot more danger. There's a lot more things that could go wrong when you're exploring other planets. You know, you've got spacesuit things or when you're um, floating, you know, outside the spacecraft in orbit and you don't have, you know, um, you're in the vacuum of space. So you're depending on your spacesuit. It's basically a spacecraft that you're inside, um, albeit one that's custom fitted around your body. Um, they have a lot more dangers. It takes a special person to sign up uh, to be an astronaut and go through that process. Not only physically and mentally challenging, you know, that process is, but um, you basically have to sign up for the dangers and, and understand that, that the, 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 the risk of you not coming home is, is uh, quite a bit higher than a normal, um, a normal day job, a normal business uh, um, office job. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I'm probably not supposed to say that <laughs> no, but, <laughs> because but, I work for NASA, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, the numbers are out there, yeah, you, exactly. Google, you know, no, what are the odds that, a, you know, that a, a, any given rocket is going to, um, explode, you know, and, but that being said, NASA does, um, they do, they do put all these safety features and, um, you know, like if the rocket does explode, we have a launch escape system that is uh, designed to pull the astronauts away from that explosion and land them safe, land them safely. So NASA does everything <coughs> it can to, to, to a degree to, you know, we, we can't guarantee that, you know, uh, we can't bring the level of danger down to zero, but we can minimize it given the budget that we have, you know, in Congress. <coughs> I love how you're so, normalizing yeah, there's a, it. There's a fine line. There's a fine line. We, we can't do everything, but like, we try to do what we can. I love it. And, and I love how you're normalizing it to this. Like, yeah, I'm just going on a day job. To I'm just going to Mars. You know, it's, it's wonderful. It, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a job to them. You know, yeah, if you exactly. ask anybody who, who fights over, you know, overseas in the military, yeah. you know, you, you call them a hero and they're like, I'm just doing yeah, my yeah, job, yeah. dude. And uh, you ask an astronaut, you know, I, you know, it's in space. It's it's a job to them. They train so re repeatedly, mm -hmm. and but when and when they're up there, they they very rarely have time to just look around and enjoy. They do have they do have scheduled free time, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know, aside from that scheduled free time, you know, they don't have time to look around and and enjoy the Earth when they're orbiting it. You know, every minute of their day is is planned out and they've got a job to do and they they try to do it, you know, perfectly, you know, as as well as they can. And um, so, yeah, they're they're very professional and, um, you know, uh, they they're they're you ask them and they just they're just like, I'm I'm just doing my job. Just it just comes it. naturally. Yeah. The training, it just, the training kicks in mm -hmm. and you just do it. Wow. <clears throat> There's so many routes I can go, but. I actually want to bring it now back to the audience. As you know, the software developers. So, what is it if you if you could think about the impact that you would like to have with your um, keynote? What what would it be? What would, what's the kind of the message um, that you have that you're bringing to to Malmoon with you? Okay, um, I'll tease just a little bit more out of the keynote. I mentioned that it was about ISRU and these technologies that we're that we're working on. Um, but I've specifically designed this keynote to um, to be story based. So I'm actually up there uh, storytelling, and uh, I mentioned before that I've done some acting, and so you know it's kind of very natural for me. And um, I think because I've ch uh, this will this will be the first time I've I've uh, given this story based keynote keynote. So I'm I'm really excited about it, and I think that the audience um, is going to be inspired. I hope that this keynote inspires them. Um, not just about this work that NASA's doing, but I hope that the keynote inspires them about the future of, of humanity because, um, you know, when we go to Mars, um, it's not just America setting foot on Mars and planting an American flag. It's, it's, this is an international effort, and, you know, I believe it's going to bring everybody together and, you know, all of it's humanity that's being sent to Mars, you know, the the 
the people of planet Earth are, are going on a mission to Mars. That's what I believe. And so um, I hope it inspires the audience and gets them excited about what NASA is doing, you know, even if, even if they're not from America, because I've written this keynote, you know, to be given anywhere in the world and hopefully inspire um, anyone in the world. Um, because uh, Mission to Mars is going to be a truly international effort. It's going to take technology from all over the world and people um, from all over the world. And um, it's, uh, it's not a race like it was during, you know, the moon mission missions with good guys against the bad guys. I, I really think it could, uh, it could bring people together from all over the world. And uh, aside from inspiring you know, I tried to make this an inspiring and, you know, to evoke emotion in the audience. But aside from that, you know, being entertaining, I, I, I just want to get the word out about what NASA is working on. Um, and this is this is one way to do it. And so if I can educate the audience there, then when they go home and, and they're at the dinner table, they can or, you know, out at the bar having some some beers with their friends, they can say, oh, yeah, NASA's doing this and NASA's doing that. And we can just kind of spread the word about what NASA's doing. So. Um, I'm really, really excited about this keynote. Yeah, and, I, and I, what I get from it is because you're talking about twen the 2030s, um, is that you do have to look into the future of, of you know, technology, right? So what I'm guessing is, is that that's also where you're looking as well, is where technology is or what technology can do in the, in the 2030s, which is really relevant for people that are working within, within that field because we, we, we just don't know. We don't know the, the, the real applications of, of, of the stuff that we're working on. Yeah, and uh, as I said, um, we are, we're, we're going to um, use the technologies we have today, and some of them need to be advanced a little bit before we'll be able to go to Mars. But most of the, most of the technology that we have today, um, including some of the research and development we're doing in SwampWorks, um, is technology that, that could take us to Mars. There are some technologies um, that are not quite there yet. Um, one off the top of my head um, that's not really ISRU related is um, ion propulsion um, technology, which um, would be a lot better to use ion propulsion if we can perfect that and scale it up. We've, we've got it working on a small scale now. I say we, I, mm. I'm not involved in that, mm. in that project, but NASA has it working on a small scale right now. But in order to use it on a Mars transport vehicle, it's going to have to be scaled up. And mm. so there are groups at NASA right now working on scaling that up. And um, hopefully they'll, uh, they'll meet mm. their timeline and get it done so that we can use it on the rocket that's going to take us to Mars in the, in the 2030s. Mm. But yeah, yeah, technology is not all there, but a lot of it, a lot of it is because NASA... Um, NASA has a research arm that, you know, takes things and tries to make them better or come up with new technologies. But when we're, but when we're planning for actual missions, um, we look at the technology that exists first and we see if we see, we do trade studies and, and uh, um, calculations to see if it can do the job. Um, um, but for, for the Mars mission, it's, it's a mix of both. We have some technology that today that'll work and we have some technology that need to, needs to be advanced before we, we'll be able to use it. Oh, and I love that. And uh, last year, one of the keynote sp speakers was it was about quantum computers. And I think that that speaks to that same thing is that they work and they can do it with like five or six chips. They have the, 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 the computers, the framework, the language. But then if you then think about how that will grow and actually w where, where that is going, it's mind-boggling, right? But they, they, it's functioning at a small scale and then it's now in this process of you know, exponentially growing it. So that's why I'm hearing it's a similar thing that you're talking to. A lot of technologies that NASA invents, um, they, they grow naturally in, outside of NASA. A lot of our, you know, like when we built a small computer for uh, Apollo, you know, that actually turned into, um, you know, oh, we need small computers so everyone can have them on their desktops. And, uh, you know, it, it grew in, it grew outside of NASA. Of course, we use, you know, we use small computers at our, on our desks too. But um, it, uh, a lot of our technologies, um, we make them uh, meet the mission um, that we have and they actually grow and advance 
a lot of times once they're spun off into uh, the real world. And that's pretty cool. And then later, a few years later, we can see those advancements and we say, oh, we'll take that back and we'll use it. You know, we might advance it a little more. It's 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 great the way, you know, we mm. can we can give and take, um, you know, from uh, uh, from the world. Yeah, no, and, and I see that, and I see that that's the synergy again. That's the relationship that, that that's the support supporting of each other. So I know that we're we're, we're way over time. So I do want to uh, end up with one question, and it's a, it's more of a challenge really for you to be able to summarize your work or your message in like a couple of sentences because we're just going to put a sound bite out. So what would you say would be? Um, let's go. Yeah, for what what's the message that you're spreading? If you could kind of put that in a couple of sentences. What is my message, my tagline? Um, my message in my keynote is that uh, we are going to Mars, not America, for, but humanity. Humanity is going to Mars. And um, um, I, I want to show off some technologies that we're going to use on Mars that a lot of people don't know about, like living off the land. Um, and uh, I, I believe that... Uh, um, it's not a race. It's not a contest that's going to Mars. And it's, I believe it's going to bring humanity together, bring people together from all around the world. Mm. And I love how you said it's going to happen. We're going to Mars. There was a, there was a certainty yeah. in your voice. And <laughs> Definitely. Can, and can I just, could you just, we, I know you're on your phone, but I'd love to see you or go back. I want to see your NASA t-shirt because I just, we, we can't see it. Yeah. Ah, there we go. <laughs> it's true. We're speaking to uh, Kurt from NASA. That's right. It's official. Although, all, although anybody could buy this shirt online, um, but that's okay. Yeah, don't tell them that. I don't that. Even know that. <laughs> so is there any last words that you have before we uh, complete the interview? Is there anything that you would like to, 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 to say? No, I just look forward to um, speaking at uh, Ordev, and um, thank you for setting this up. It was, uh, it was a real pleasure, and uh, I can't wait to see everybody in Sweden. Excellent. Thank you, Kurt. I'm going to switch.